Welcome from Los Angeles, USA, uh, from the USC Roski Eye Institute, Keck Medicine of USC, Dr. Benjamin Xu. He's assistant professor of clinical ophthalmology. His expertise is clinical and surgical management of all forms of glaucoma, and he will speak about clinical applications of quantitative anterior segment OCT imaging in angle closure disease. Welcome, Benjamin. Good morning, everyone from California. And thank you very much to the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak today. I don't have any financial disclosures, although I do receive funding support from the NIH as well as various foundations. And I do receive research support from Heidelberg Engineering. I'd like to begin my talk today by reviewing the conventional aqueous outflow pathway. Aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary body and it must flow between the iris and the lens in order to enter the anterior chamber. There it exits the eye through the trabecular meshwork, which is located in the anterior chamber angle. In angle closure, the iris is displaced anteriorly and comes into contact with the trabecular meshwork. This impedes the normal flow of aqueous through the trabecular meshwork and as aqueous builds up inside the eye, there is an elevation of intraocular pressure. Over time, this can lead to primary angle closure glaucoma. Primary angle closure glaucoma, or PACG, is a common cause of permanent vision loss worldwide. It's thought that it currently affects approximately 20 million people, and this number will rapidly increase over the next two decades due to aging of the world's population. Just as concerning is the fact that there are over 150 million people with some degree of angle closure, which puts them at risk for developing PACG. Gonioscopy is the current clinical standard for detecting angle closure and evaluating the anterior chamber angle. In gonioscopy, a gonio lens is placed on the surface of the cornea, and through one of the mirrors, the structures of the angle can be visualized. The key anatomical structure on gonioscopy is this middle brown band called the pigmented trabecular meshwork. This is the site of most of the aqueous outflow from the eye. When this structure is not visible on gonioscopy, then angle closure is detected. In this way, gonioscopy is a qualitative assessment of the status of the angle. Gonioscopy, although it is the clinical standard, has a number of limitations. Gonioscopy is subjective and expertise dependent. So even after years of experience, uh, it is difficult to attain a high level of proficiency with gonioscopy. There's only moderate inter-examiner reproducibility, even amongst trained glaucoma specialists. And the examination technique can be uncomfortable for some patients since it requires contact with the eye. Gonioscopy can also be time consuming for eye care providers since it has to be performed prior to pupillary dilation. And recent landmark studies have shown that gonioscopy is poorly predictive of progression from early angle closure to primary angle closure glaucoma. Due to these limitations, eye care providers are in urgent need of new clinical methods to evaluate and manage patients with angle closure. One potential solution to this problem is anterior segment OCT or ASOCT. Anterior segment OCT is a non-invasive, non-contact form of ocular imaging, and it's capable of acquiring high resolution in vivo images of the anterior segment. Here's a representative image from the recently released Heidelberg Anterion ASOCT system. We can see here the cornea, the iris, and the lens but you can also clearly see the anterior chamber angle on both sides. One structure that you cannot visualize here is the trabecular meshwork due to the rel re relatively long wavelength of the scanning laser. Therefore, we have to rely on identifying a landmark, the scleral spur that sits directly posterior to the trabecular meshwork in order to identify the location of the trabecular meshwork. Once the scleral spurs have been identified and the various structures have been segmented, we then have access to quantitative measurements of biometric parameters. Some of these biometric parameters describe the anterior chamber angle and its width or area. And some describe the dimensions of the anterior chamber, 
the cornea, and the lens. These quantitative measurements have a variety of applications in the field of angle closure, and I'm going to review a few of them here. One potential application of ASOCT in angle closure is the ability to evaluate an individual patient's risk for elevated IOP. We studied the relationship between ASOCT measurements of angle width and IOP in this 2018 study. We used data from the Chinese American Eye Study, which was a population-based epidemiologic study conducted by USC here in Los Angeles in an area with a high density of Chinese Americans who are known to have a higher prevalence of angle closure. In this figure, we plot IOP against a measurement called TISA, which is uh, a measurement of the amount of area that is located in the anterior chamber angle. What we can see here is for wider angles, there is very little relationship between angle width and intraocular pressure. However, below a critical threshold, which we called a change point value, there emerges a strong correlation between the TISA measurement and intraocular pressure. Therefore, we speculate that a patient's proximity uh, to one of these change points in terms of their angle width measurement could prognosticate their risk for elevated intraocular pressure. Another application of ASOCT in angle closure is the ability to quantify response to treatment. This is an OT OCT scan obtained with the Heidelberg spectralis with the anterior segment module. And while the imaging window here is smaller due to the shorter imaging wavelength, we can see that the iris, lens, and anterior chamber angle are still visible. This patient received a laser peripheral iridotomy as treatment for their angle closure. And after treatment, the patient still had residual angle closure on gonioscopy. However, based on ASOCT, we can see that there is widening of the angle. And in fact, we can use measurement tools to assess exactly how much the angle has widened after treatment. A third potential application is the ability to monitor longitudinal changes in angle width over time. This 2014 study demonstrated that the angle continues to narrow over time, even when the eye is treated with LPI. We see that both in eyes that are treated and those that are untreated, there is progressive angle narrowing over time. And having the ability to track patients over time will help us identify patients whose angle narrowing is progressing at a rapid rate and identify patients who may benefit from prompt treatment with LPI or lens extraction. I've described some of the clinical applications of ASOCT. However, it's important to point out that ASOCT currently also has its limit, limitations uh, in terms of its clinical utility. One primary limitation is the fact that image analysis, especially quantitative image analysis, um, can be time consuming and expertise dependent. And the lack of fully automated methods that facilitate quantitative ASOCT imaging has really limited its clinical utility, especially in the field of angle closure. I mentioned previously the importance of identifying the scleral spur and how quantitative measurements cannot be obtained until the scleral spur has been identified. Identifying the scleral spur can be easy in some cases. The scleral spur is defined as the junction between the inner curvature of the cornea and the boundary between the ciliary body and the sclera. In this open angle eye, it's relatively easy to identify the location of the scleral spur. However, take this example of a patient with angle closure. Here, there's apposition between the iris and the trabecular meshwork so that identification of the scleral spur is not so obvious and requires some experience and training. Therefore, my lab recently asked a simple question, which is, can the scleral spur detection be automated to facilitate quantitative ASOCT imaging? To address this question, we turn to artificial intelligence, or AI. AI has been all throughout the news recently and it has been broadly applied in the field of ophthalmology. Simply put, AI is when computers are taught cognitive functions, including learning and problem solving. And deep learning is a very popular form of AI that has been used in the field of ophthalmology to automate image analysis 
for detecting diseases, including diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and glaucomatous optic neuropathy. We applied deep learning methods to develop a convolutional neural network algorithm that could detect the location of the scleral spur in an ASOCT image. In order to do this, we used data from the Chinese American Eye Study. The ASOCT images that we had access to were acquired on an older swept source ASOCT device called the Casio One. In total, we had over 18,000 images. And one of the graduate students in my lab, Anmal Pardeshi, was kind enough to label all 18,000 plus images with the scleral spur locations. We used 95% of this data to train the convolutional neural network and 5% of the data to test it. Development of the convolutional neural network was done by another graduate student in my lab, Michael Chang. Here's the performance of our deep learning algorithm. This scatter plot reflects the prediction errors, which we defined as the ground truth or reference coordinates minus the predicted coordinates by the algorithm. What you can see here is that most predictions fall within 100 microns of the ground truth coordinate. We can also see that the average X and Y errors is approximately zero, and the standard deviation of these errors is approximately 60 microns in both the X and Y directions. In order to contextualize this result, we had the expert grader regrade the test data set so that we could visualize the intra-observer variability in detecting the scleral spur. What we see here is a scatter plot that is quite similar. The X and Y mean errors are approximately zero, and the standard deviation, again, is approximately 60 microns in both the X and Y direction. Here's another way of visualizing the data. Here we've calculated absolute error, which is a Euclidean distance that combines X and Y coordinate errors. We see that 75% of all errors, both by the deep learning algorithm and by the expert human fall within 100 microns. And 90% of predictions falls within 150 microns. These error distances are represented here below. And we can see that even 150 microns is a relatively small error on an ASOCT image. These results taken in total suggest that we have really achieved uh, human expert level performance in, in our ability to automatically detect this little spur using a deep learning approach. It was uh, while we were developing this algorithm that Heidelberg first approached me with this question, which is, does the Cassius scleral spur detection algorithm work on the anterior? And after some quick tests, the answer was, was a very obvious no. One reason that, um, that our deep learning algorithm did not generalize is that when you place a Cassia 1 image next to an anterior image, you can see the dramatic difference in image quality between these two devices. The Cassia 1 image is much more grainy and less detailed. And these differences are enough to break a already somewhat fragile deep learning algorithm. To solve this problem, we decided to ap apply the same deep learning methods and develop a new convolutional neural network that could detect the scleral spur in anterior images. Heidelberg Engineering provided us with 1,500 total images with corresponding scleral spur locations, which were marked by a expert at Heidelberg. We used 50% of this data to train our convolutional neural network and 50% to test it. While my team was developing uh, our algorithm, Martin Simonovsky from Heidelberg Engineering was using a different uh, deep learning architecture in order to develop his own algorithm. When we compared the results uh, of the two algorithms, the performance of the two was quite similar. However, Martin's did perform slightly better. And I'm going to present the results of his algorithm here. Here's a scatter plot that indicates the prediction errors of Martin's algorithm. This scatter plot should look quite familiar. And what we see here is that the average error in the X and Y directions is approximately zero. In addition, the standard deviation is approximately 60 microns. And when I put this next to the scatter plot from our original algorithm, we see that they are quite similar. In fact, when you superimpose one scatter plot on top of the other, we see that 
the performance of both of these algorithms is incredibly similar, which suggests that the anterior sclerospur detection algorithm has also achieved human expert level performance. And this is impressive given that the two algorithms were trained on different images um, using, uh, using different architectures and using reference labels provided by two different expert graders. Now that we have a scleral spur detection algorithm for the anterion, we can combine this with the inbuilt segmentation algorithms in order to develop a fully automated quantitative ASOCT imaging program. I'm excited to announce that we will be performing a clinical validation of this program and recruitment is set to start at USC next month. Our plan is to recruit approximately 200 subjects and we will be comparing manually derived quantitative measurements with automated quantitative measurements, which will be produced by this program. And I look forward to sharing the results of this study with you next year. In summary, ASOCT imaging could modernize the clinical care of patients with angle closure. Deep learning al algorithms can detect the scleral spur with human expert level performance. And now we have the capability to automate quantitative ASOCT imaging on the anterior. I really believe that this has tremendous potential to greatly enhance the clinical utility of ASOCT imaging in the field of angle closure. I'd like to end by just acknowledging the contributions of the people in my lab, including Anmol Pardeshi and Michael Chang, who worked on this project. And I'd like to sincerely thank Heidelberg Engineering for showing interest and believing in the importance of my lab's work. Thank you very much for your attention. And for those of you who are in a place where you celebrate Halloween, happy Halloween. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Well, celebrating Halloween is a little bit tricky these times, at least here in Germany, it's actually forbidden. Anyway, but uh, um, uh, that might be different elsewhere. Uh, we have a, 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 a comment maybe, really. Um, Great talk, Benjamin. It says, until the AI problem is solved, I recommend from the practical point of view to flicker brightness up and down in order to see the scleral spur better, um, especially with the anterior image quality that works quite often. So I think there's a comment. I don't know if this is of any help for the audience. And there's a second question related to your comparison between um, uh, the different images and why the AI uh, worked on the one and not on the other. And the question is, for, can you explain for us not being AI experts, how can it be that an algorithm works on a objectively worse image compared to a better image? What, can you help explaining that? Right, so the way that these algorithms work can sometimes be kind of a black box, but you can imagine that it, the algorithm essentially becomes like a hyper-specialized human in that it's only able to do the task that it's trained to do. And because we only ever exposed it to uh, Cassia one images, it wasn't able to generalize its task to um, an image of a different quality. Even if it's a better quality, it's these subtle differences in terms of the sharpness of the boundaries, the lack of graininess, even the position of the angle in the image can cause a deep learning algorithm to break. Now, in this case, we tried to implement um, workarounds, including the ability to shift the image around in the, in the algorithm's um, field of analysis, but these weren't sufficient to convert it to uh, the anterior images. This is why we had to completely retrain the algorithm. And this is not uncommon uh, in the field of deep learning for these algorithms to be relatively fragile. And the final quick question, um, when will be the AI algorithm for the anterior available, at least from, from your work point of view, not from us implementing it? Can you give a, an idea, a time frame for that? Yeah, so it's going to be a, a period of time. Um, at least a year or two. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, the anterior is EMARC, but it's not yet FDA approved for one thing. And once we have the algorithm, we will have to make sure that it is also approved by the, by the appropriate regulatory bodies. So I, I do hope that within the next couple of years, we will be able to roll this out because as I mentioned, it has tremendous clinical utility in the field of angle closure. Benjamin, 
thanks again for uh, being with us and that great talk. Uh, we really enjoyed it and, and uh, we're looking forward to the news from your lab, uh, in particular sclerosis birth and AI. And I have to leave you, unfortunately,